panel discussion which will be regarding the research based learning skill development and multidisciplinary approach a robust ecosystem in agis and uh, to do the session i would like to welcome our eminent panel speaker as well as our session moderator dr navin das the vice chancellor officiating and pro vice chancellor adams university kolkata west bengal on the stage with a huge round of applause along with him please welcome our uh, next panel speaker professor dr partho sharuti chakraborty group ceo mckv group howra west bengal partho sharuti sir you are requested to please come and join us for this panel discussion along with him i would also like to welcome mr meghdoot roy choudhury the executive director and chief innovation officer techno india university kolkata west bengal on the stage with a huge round of applause everybody and also i would like to welcome professor supriya patnayak vice chancellor centurion university of technology and management bhuvaneshwar odisha on the stage with a huge huge round of applause i would also like to request uh, mr maj jain vs ranare the director kolkata west bengal on the stage to please join us on the panel discussion একটু জোরে হাততালি হয়ে যায় ক্যানি হ্যাভ এ হিউজ রাউন্ড অফ প্লাস ফর অল আর এমিনেন্ট স্পিকারস এন্ড অফ কোর্স লাস্ট বাট নট দ্য লিস্ট আরতি দিবেদি ম্যাম দ্য অ্যাকাউন্ট ডিরেক্টর এন্ড রিজিয়নাল হেড একাডেমিক এন্ড गवर्नमेंट লিংকড ইন অন দ্য স্টেজ थैंक यू सो मच एवरीबॉडी सो नाउ ओवर टू यू नवीन सर क्लॉक सेज दैट वी हैव अबाउट 10 मिनिट्स टाइम इफ यू हैव टू रैप अप by the planned time but then i would request uh, the organizers to give us please some time some extra time maybe 15 more minutes so that makes us about uh, 25 minutes at our disposal i think uh, the panel doesn't need any further introduction i'm so lucky and privileged to have such an esteemed panel with me and i'm also reminded of oscar wilde who said that you know in everything that we do moderation is always the best policy even in moderation so like a true moderator i would uh, be brief short to the point we have been discussing about various facets of education right from morning so uh, many of the points have already been discussed debated uh, so just to touch upon not to bring about any further new issue but to give some st some strings to my panel uh, to have their initial comments on i will go exactly by the way the organizers had planned earlier uh, to begin with i would give 2 minutes to each of my panelists to have some opening remarks of these three important aspect of education research based learning multidisciplinary approach and the skill development of any learning research based learning multidisciplinary approach and the skill development of learning these are all related we all know people who have spent their lifetime in education we know that you try to differentiate each one of them and you will be faltering on either one or the other the new education policy which has come up during the pandemic has given a flip to this thought suddenly the whole world is talking about skills the whole world is talking about not becoming uh, a lopsided creature in our education the whole objective of education has been to become uh, or rather to make our students uh, holistic uh, professionals and at the same time at least to my small mind i do not uh, i cannot imagine learning to be anything but research how can learning be not research when we read a book when we read a story book when we read theory we are actually researching in our mind what our past uh, authors what our past thinkers have have said and trying to match with what we think and that is exactly what research is all about so without much ado i would go exactly the way we have sat starting with aarti ma'am 
and finishing with Parthoda, uh, about uh, two minutes about uh, these three important topics. Your opening remarks, ma'am. Thank you so much, sir. It's again an opportunity to share the stage with all of you. Um, definitely, out of the three topics, which excites me the most is the skill development. I've been talking about that since morning. And I guess uh, being at LinkedIn, we believe skilling and upskilling, it's really important for everyone today, be it me or be it the students or the freshers we are talking about. What at LinkedIn we talk about is that LinkedIn has become the new resume. And we talk about resume, we know that we talk about our qualifications, we talk about the degrees, the projects, etc. How LinkedIn is helping our, it's called the new resume, because we have seen now when the companies are hiring, they talk more about skills. They, they talk about the specific skill sets they are looking for. Hence, to every job posting, we have started attaching the skill sets, which give us and our students and the institutes the insights, the knowledge about the skills. Definitely, uh, I believe that today it's totally important to have uh, technical skills, business skills, also soft skills. It's very important for us to even understand and communicate well what skills. It's not limited to the language, but definitely it's important that we are able to communicate. That is what uh, I would love to add on this. Thank you. General, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, giving an opportunity, and it gets it's quite overwhelming to certain uh, Rich academia with here. I agree with uh, with the ma'am view that skill today is a very very important aspect as far as learning is concerned. Let's face fact: our academics are by rote. We are uh, by chalk and duster. But at the end of the day, the chalk and duster does not uh, give us that kind of a uh, a capability to convert that knowledge into a livelihood. And that is what we looking at at the skill development. That is what is being required for the corporates and the industry is looking at specific skill sets which we must inculcate in the academic curriculum, which is very, very important. Uh, as we say in the Indian Army, that uh, get your hands dirty. And if you get your hands dirty, that means it's hands-on job. And if you have a hands-on job, I think you are expert. You are having a very, very fine uh, integration between the academic classroom learning and the practical learning on ground, which is very much required. More to follow later. I will uh, uh, stop here and then we'll let the panel continue. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> As our esteemed panelists before have already spoken about skill development, I think I'll, the sake of uh, brevity of time, I'm going to move past that and speak about the other two topics in very brief. First is the uh, multidisciplinary side of education, which obviously has seen a lot more presence in popular media since it got featured about 56 times on the NEP, if we look at it. And um, it's something, it's a, it's a viewpoint that I've had very secret, uh, sacred uh, on, my, on my part as being somebody who's been on every single kind of activity when I was in school, uh, you know, be it from quizzing to debating to uh, representing the school at every single function that was possible. Um, everything contributes to being multidisciplinary, right? And I think the NEP, essentially, and much to the, it could be to the ire of people in the audience, especially in academia. Um, I, I personally believe the NEP was about 20 years too late in addressing how important multidisciplinary uh, education is in, uh, in any kind of education system. And um, thankfully, there have been institutions of repute in, in our country which has uh, imbibed it already in their own ways and forms, which has resulted today 
in us seeing that some of the biggest uh, CEOs of the tech companies globally are uh, of Indian origin. So we must have done something right in our uh, education systems, right? So that I don't think can be contributed uh, only to a change in institutionalized um, way of looking at education in, in academia. So that's my first point on multidisciplinarity. And the second one on research, uh, I believe one of the things that's lacking the most in our country uh, in the research space currently, uh, two problems. One is uh, plagiarism in general. I think you know, it's a lot of borrowed research that is being passed off as original research. I don't think with the advent of uh, artificial intelligence with GPT-3 engine getting as popular as it has become already the most used app of all time in the last two months, I don't think that's going to get a lot better. I think it's uh, most of our research is going to get more and more diluted. Uh, if you look at uh, the global research space, uh, Indian research is not held at, uh, at the same level as most of, uh, say, American or uh, European universities are. And that's because there's a lot of um, dilution in the world of research. And the other, the other point that I'd like to touch upon in the research space, and I'd love to hear what our co-panelists have to say about it, is the lack of actionable research, because there's very few institutions working towards uh, you know, building uh, companies or building co uh, startups out of the research that comes out of the institutions. And these you know, massive research papers end up becoming uh, absolute trash in, in days to come. I, in, on an average, it says, it's, and it's an actual statistic, I'm not, I'm not, they say that all statistics themselves are statistics and somebody's come up with that, right? But on average, a PhD thesis is read by three people at most on the average one, and two of them are the person who's written it and the person who's reviewed it. So I'd love to hear what my other panelists have to say about it. Supriya, ma'am. Um, first of all, thank you and uh, for making me one of the speakers at this panel. I think uh, it's such a wonderful opportunity to meet everybody. Um, I just uh, have a few statements to make. One is that, you know, everybody speaks of skills. The question is, how do we actually, uh, you know, ra rather, how do we actually embed it within the curriculum? And I think that is a key thing. I'll just speak of our own experience and I'll tell you what we, our approach has been to embed skills. First of all, we say that we are a skill university, one of the few skill universities in the country. And we have actually tried to integrate skills into higher education. Again, easier said than done. What do we do? So what we have done is we have Every one of our units, every one of our courses, we have a combination of theory, practice, and project. So it is either, a, either all three of them, or two, or just one. But as little theory as possible. So we actually want to see that people learn through practice and through project. We also have about uh, identified about hundred skill electives, and about 45 what we call domain specializations. And again, when you took a look at multidisciplinarity, we have actually opened these specializations to all people, all the students of the university. So a person from engineering can do a specialization in agriculture. Somebody from uh, allied health can do uh, something in engineering. So that is the way we look at how uh, to kind of, en en uh, you know, I guess, make this, make you go at multidisciplinarity. Uh, we also have uh, what we call a community action learning program whereby students who learn a program actually go and try it out in the community. So if a person does an engineering, say an electrical engineering diploma, he goes out in the community, finds out what are the appliances which might, might not be working, actually ends up fixing it and then, so I'll just tell you about the logical flow from that. So it's not just about fixing it, but he learns a lot of skills of communication, negotiation, and all that. But then eventually, because we are also giving them training on climate change, they even eventually talk about effective, efficient appliances and how it relates to climate change. So there's an awareness generation also that happens with it. 
So this is how we look at our community action learning program. We also have it in the field of allied health. We have a program with industry, uh, with SLR for example, where our students actually make lenses and distribute among the poor. So this is the kind of things that uh, we have. Uh, the logical conclusion of this, okay, first I would just like to say that we, so we follow a pro, uh, a approach that involves teaching, training, employability, employment, and entrepreneurship. It encourages students to develop products, simulate, test, prototype, and finally commercialize. So what we have done actually is that we have been able to facilitate some students to have startups on campus, and they've actually made it commercially viable. So they're actually students are uh, producing e-rickshaws, we also have some industry uh, labs, which makes it very, uh, very hands-on training for students. We have more than 50, which is highly enviable, and this increases their en employability. We have also promoted several uh, uh, production units ourselves, so that works as labs for students to practice. But what is most interesting is that we are also, uh, as a university, as a skill university, we are a registered vendor and where, why we produce high precision components for HL, ISRO, DRDO. So the students are getting very hands-on training. They are actually going and producing these high precision components. We also are uh, being a skill university. We support the World Skills Competition. And uh, we had last year, one of our students actually compete internationally, representing the country in uh, the uh, CNC turning skill. So, you can see how we have tried to embed skills in everything that we do. And we have over, and this is across all courses. I gave some examples from engineering, but it is embedded within all our courses. And I said the multidisciplinarity is there. The only thing to support this, we have also started, established about 20 research centers. And what we believe in is in some ways we have completely aligned with NEP right from the outset. Actually, we, we are just a 10-year-old university. So even prior to NEP, we were there. We have our own skill qualification framework. Uh, we believe in uh, something what we call uh, is a creative dissatisfaction. Unless you are creatively dissatisfied, unless you push for disruptions, you will not keep, you won't be an agile university to keep pace with what is happening every day. The changes are so fast that you need to be extremely agile. So with these few words, I'd like to say thank you. Uh, three terms are there. RBL, it's not the bank RBL. It's SD, not the standard deviation. And MDA, multidisciplinary approach. These three terms are required where there is an environment, educational environment. What sort of education? Higher education environment. How do you define higher education? School and college. It's a misnomer. These three terms, RBL, SD, MDA, required even in school education. That is my conception. Let's think about your childhood. Your mother is cooking in a kitchen. Suddenly, your distant relative come in. Less vegetables are there. They have come in at a such a time, they require lunch. What is that? Research. So she thinks what sort of item she has to prepare with less amount of vegetables to feed them. Everybody is a researcher in the true sense. A new wet lady doesn't know how to cook after four, one year. She learns how to cook. Skill development. Multidisciplinary. She doesn't know how to sing. But she has observed that in many occasions, like marriage, birthday party, if someone sings, she gets praised. She starts learning singing, either through YouTube, either through some friend. 
she was not a singer but she learns multidisciplinary approach it happens to everybody it happens in everyday situations it happens every corner of life it happens in field it happens in factories so it's not the hgi higher educational institution it is everywhere we have come across many sort of theories now the everybody talks about obe outcome based education bloom's taxonomy why because nac has come nba has come npe has come suppose there is no npa suppose that committee doesn't exist we are a country like pakistan so what is the need of national policy of education 15 years back there was education policy let it be like continue is not finland that it requires to be updated national policy as per the global need so someone has made kasturi rangan and his team and the government is trying to implement since 2018 lot of draft committees lot of suggestions modifications it has come down from 30 500 pages to 200 pages now and everybody is trying to are you conscious we are teachers ek think of a situation that being a teacher np doesn't suggest there is no existence of np how, how much we are trying to implement from our own mind i do think that's my personal opinion we do not get good teachers in most of the academic institutions someone said in the last session that is those who are not able to get some t jobs they come for teaching assignment it's unfortunate so i my suggestion is that these things are required these things required earlier and will be requiring every moment this rvl not the bank standard deviation that is skill development and multidisciplinary one supplementary when i talk about the multidisciplinary it's my experiment we started one in course btech electrical and electronics there are no takers ai city approved i don't know how many colleges in west bengal that stream exist if you make btech degree of 4 years mechanical plus electrical if we, if i say i am a doctor specialized in cardiology and i you will have less trust on me so it's not the multidisciplinary let it be interdisciplinary approach thank you thank you sir <clears throat> in fact to summarize my five panelists all learn it their own way is very very difficult but let me still attempt it i think uh, i must thank uh, mr roy choudhury to to actually challenge all of us here and i know your position makes it easier for you to challenge the others with obviously plagiarism in re in research and that much of our research is actually not outcome based and uh, what he mentioned was also partly correct is partly correct that there are very few people who actually read the research that we do and particularly those for whom we think we are doing research the stakeholders actually don't care we have to think seriously about this on the education front if we if we take education and skill to be the two sides of the same coin uh major general ranadi i think hit the nail on the head when he said that we have to get our hands dirty it's not enough to know something but we should also be able to apply through the skills that we have and ma'am uh arti ma'am mentioned about all the three types of skills the soft skills the technical skills and the business skills if we have these skills i think even if the domain that we are studying is remotely related to business i think there will be an economic viability also that supriya ma'am hinted at which she is practicing at centurion and lastly 
sir i think uh, parthu sir you actually mentioned about making education seated in practicality seated in the context if education is seated in context automatically research based education skill development as well as multidisciplinary will automatically come in our education and as he rightly mentioned more than multidisciplinarity i think we should first attempt to have interdisciplinarity and then perhaps aim at multidisciplinary we are still a long way to go to become multidisciplinary with these comments uh, i would rather like to throw open uh, the panel to a couple of questions from the audience i think you have waited for long so i think you deserve some time if you can ask any question to any body in the panel specific or even to the whole panel i think we would uh, be more than happy to answer any question there is i think centurion has been doing i have visited their campus centurion does fantastic job on this research which is industry oriented not academic research he he talked about industry oriented research ma'am would you be able would you like to answer or yes. maybe you can sir uh, no uh, thank you for that question actually i think that's a very pertinent question for all academic institutions today you know whether the research is and Uh, my colleague my co panelist here actually raised the same question as to how much of the research is actually applied how much of it is actually relevant we are doing research for the sake of research and we are almost dated in the kind of even phd research which is taking place today we are taking up topics which are 10 years old we are not taking up what is current so we are already dated so i think it's a big challenge so what we say in at centurion is that you have the practice do your research around the practice so if you are building a poly house you look at how you automate it so the engineers come in and do the research around what are the parameters because they don't know anything about agriculture so they work around researching that and embedding it into that and then only you have a solution which you can take then to the farmers you can take that to the other institutions so that is the way we have to go about it otherwise it's always going to be uh, you know either very theoretical or quite dated uh, sir what i what you have meant what if i have understood that how come an industry person can be included in academics though he may not have academic research am i correct fine there are plenty of people those who are involved in this steel industry chemical plants having diploma in engineering master master craftsman they can teach our mtech phd students doing phd without going to the university btech mtech phd and those persons those who have spent time under the blast furnace in the chemical plants having diploma make of polytechnic knows much better their research articles are published in the trade journals industry journals not that ugc approved aict approved now there are panel of journals where it will have the all this system citing all the no they but that's the reason we have been fighting with the ict and the ai city has approached us and probably you may be aware those people has to be recognized they will be offered prince professor post without phd they will be offered adjunct professor post without phd even a diploma engineer professor of practice i treat them on role as per the requirement so government the present government has been trying to at least bring the they are the mainstream technicians 
They are the mainstream technologists and engineers, not we. Having completed B.Tech, M.Tech, PhD, never went to any industry, but getting the cream of becoming intellectual and the academicians is wrong. So we have to mix. We have to bring those mainstream engineers after they retire or after they take voluntary retirement in academics with proper respect. We still have time for just one question. Yes. Can there be a mic given? As one of our panelists mentioned uh, that, uh, you know, apps like chat, GPT, uh, GPT and all coming to, uh, into existence and more are coming uh, from the back. So how, do, how should an academia, you know, prepare themselves for that challenge? Because it is going to be what we foresee a major disruption and all, you know, academia has to be prepared accordingly. So what should an academia do to, to, to you know, to prepare ourselves for this kind of challenges that is coming up. So, <clears throat> if you look at the world of uh, neural networks and the way it, uh, the way it's functioning now, the way it has been made available to the public, um, most of this disruption has happened in the last two years. Does that mean that GPT engines did not exist before that? Absolutely not. We're on the GPT three, or four is coming. Research on this by this particular company that we've been hearing about often. OpenAI has been happening for a while. Now, why did it become so relevant recently is because a huge amount of money, almost to the tune of a billion dollars, was spent by Elon Musk on this particular company to accelerate the progress, which meant more smart engineers coming in together and building out a better engine. Now, we're at GPT-3. This is where it gets interesting. I don't know how many of you are, available, uh, are aware of uh, how these engines work. We're at GPT-3, if we compare it in terms of size, let's say, and its computing power, if we say that GPT-3 engine now is the Earth, what is coming after this GPT-4 in 2024, mid-24, we should have it, is going to be the size of the sun. Now, if we know anything about it, if we've ever gone to a uh, geography class in school, I think, you know, we, we, we know about how much bigger the Earth, the, how much bigger the sun is than the Earth. So we know that in terms of what we're talking about, disruptive powers, we are very far from even scratching the surface. What does normally happen when massive disruptions like this occur everywhere in the world? The anti-disruption uh, movement also starts. So the same way, say for example, when drones started getting made and being used by, uh, by common people and more importantly by armies, the anti-drone uh, companies started coming in which, would, which had the ability to shoot down the drones. Very similarly, there's a bunch of my friends currently who are working on multi-billion dollar anti-chat GPT engines which would be plagiarism checks. Now, the issue is not with the availability of these technologies. The issue is, do we even understand that we need to use them? Do we even need, do we understand? Because if you look at academia today, my biggest issue with academia in general, and see, I mean, a lot of, I might again cause ire to a lot of people here, especially senior academics who've been in this world, but the biggest issue with academia is we exist only in echo chambers. We only talk to each other. We only talk to people in academia. And every time a young person goes into academia, you're talking about four years spent in learning something which by the time they come out, it's already over, right? So it's not going to be up to the young people to understand. They're going to make a lot of money in building anti chat GPT engines. It's about the adoption by people like us. Are we even interested in learning about the problem and working against it? It requires significant amount of research and development uh, funds. It requires significant investment in that. And if you're able to do that, we will, you know, academia will continue happening. One last point is that uh, I don't know if any of you have used a ChatGPT engine ever, but it's still very far away from being what being an alternative for human uh, work. So, for example, uh, if you want to write a PhD thesis on ChatGPT, it's actually possible to do. One of my friends has actually tried it out. As an, uh, as an experience, he was, doing a, he was doing a PhD at Zurich University, he tried it out. And the one thing that he said was, you know what, it's basically like having a hundred terrible interns doing your work. You still have to get it together and stitch it and make the biryani yourself. Right? You have the stuff available, which is 
fairly good, a bit backdated because nothing on ChatGPT that we see is uh, updated past 2021. That's the last time. So all the engines currently are 2021 and uh, from before that. Uh, so we're still very far away from making it a human uh, replacement. But a lot of work to be done and more, more work to be done by us, I think. Otherwise, you know, Academy is going to have a tough time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ch Rai Chaudhary. Uh, well, I think uh, I, I take the last point of yours and say that we as academics, we have to break the narrow domestic walls that we have created around ourselves. The world expects much more from us. The world expects a bit more practical of us. The world expects that we do research, we teach more to seat research and learning in the context. So with those words, I wrap up the session. Thank you very much for giving us this opportunity. And thank you all my fellow uh, panelists. You've done a fantastic job of keeping uh, the time just delayed by 20 minutes. <laughs> thank you very much. <clears throat> All right, uh, so now I request uh, Mr. Vishwajit Ghosh, the Vice Chancellor of the Nutia University on the stage and felicitate our respected dignitaries on the dais one by one for their eminent and remarkable performance in the industry. So first I'm going to start up uh, with the panel speaker as well as the session moderator of this wonderful session, Dr. Naveen Das, the Vice Chancellor, Officiating and Pro-Vice Chancellor, Adamus University, Kolkata, West Bengal. Next, I would request her to please felicitate Professor Dr. Partho Sharuti Chakraborty, Group CEO, NCKB Group, NCKB Institute of Engineering and other units out of West Bengal with a huge round of applause, everybody. Thank you. So now I would request to felicitate our next speaker, Meghdu Troy Choudhury, Executive Director and Chief Innovation Officer, Techno India University, Kolkata, West Bengal. Iguazota Kalio ke saath, unka samman kiya jai. And uh, we also had Professor Supriya Patnayak, the Vice Chancellor, Centurion University of Technology and Management, Bhuvaneshwar, Odisha. So, I would like to say, Sir and Ma'am, please take one and take your certificates so that our photographer can uh, click the picture. to please uh, welcome and felicitate the Major General V.S. Runner, the Director, Kolkata West Bengal, with a huge round of applause. 